School for Many is a horror story in itself. However, far worse things can happen than getting a detention. So get comfortable and let the darkness take control. Number one. In my sophomore year of high school, my friend was murdered. Going back, freshman year when I was in homeroom, I became friends with the girl who sat in front of me. Her name was Deanna Wright. We came from the same neighborhood and both worked at pizza shops a few blocks away. One night, I remember she had texted me asking if I wanted to do something. This was before everyone had unlimited cell phone plans. I had the Nokia that was basically a brick. And since I had to pay for minutes we used to text, and if it was short, we could get away with not having to open it and therefore being charged the 0.5 per minute. She told me she had a fight with her mum and felt like going out and smoking some weed. I had work and couldn't be done until we closed up until 1am. Since I needed gas money, I told her that I couldn't blow off work, but I might come out afterwards. She sighed and said okay, and to text her when I was done at work to see if she was still out because she didn't decide what she was going to do yet. At 1.15, I texted her but didn't get a reply. No big deal. I thought she probably was asleep. So Saturday, I text her. Nothing. Sunday, nothing. Again, I thought she was probably grounded. That's why she was mad to begin with. She was grounded and went out and got grounded again. Monday, I came into school and I hear the teachers make an announcement. Sorry to inform you, but Deanna is missing. Her family has reported her missing after she left and went out and never came home. The teacher said this in a despondent tone, and my stomach dropped. My fingers tingled. I couldn't believe it. Apparently that night, she ended up hanging out with a guy who she met up working at the pizza shop. Everything was going great. She was a beautiful girl. She was a model so we know what he was thinking. We aren't exactly sure in what order everything went down, but she was drugged, raped, and strangled. Then her vile murderer decided to cut up her body into pieces, put her into a steel drum, and light her on fire. I think about that night over and over again. Should I have gone? Would I have really made any difference? Or would he have just killed us both? Her father was an FBI agent, so it truly goes to show that if someone is evil and wants to kill you, then nothing, and I mean not a thing, will get in their way. So Lamar Hames, please, let's not meet. Number two. So it was my junior year, and I was sitting in my geometry class, waiting for the bell to ring. It was the last period of the day. It was about 10 minutes before the bell, and my teacher had long since stopped lecturing and was sitting at his desk to let us get a head start on homework. When the phone rings, he picks up, converses with the person on the other line for a while, and hangs up. He informs us that the buses are running late and that we are all to stay in the classrooms until further instructions are given. Oh, okay, whatever. We don't think too much about it. Half hour passes and we're still given no instruction. Finally, he gets another call and this time we're told that we need to sit down on the floor away from the windows and doors. Absolutely no one leaves the classroom for any reason. Another hour passes, and still nothing. Whilst most of us are sitting away from the doors, there are a few people who can see out of the tiny rectangular window, and say that they see people with helmets walking by every now and again. Time drags on, 
It's been five hours past the time that we were supposed to be dismissed. And finally, there's a knock on the door. A man calls in, saying he's with the police and to open up. He has a gun, and he escorts us through the school and out through the main entrance, where we are patted down and sniffed by dogs, and our backpacks searched thoroughly. Nothing found. We're escorted to the giant field house. Half the school is there already, and there are more kids from different classes filling in. People are talking about how there was a bomb threat, how some kid got shot, or how someone saw someone with a gun. We are detained for another hour or so before we're finally released, and at this point it's around 9pm. It isn't until a week later, after extensive investigation, that they determined who had done it, and that it had all been a hoax. Because it was a minor, they weren't naming anyone, until one local radio station shouted out the person who did it. And yeah, it was this girl who lived next door who I grew up with. She said that she had been cornered by a group of girls in the bathroom, and that they had shoved a gun in her mouth, and were making all kinds of threats to shooting up the school. She got expelled, obviously, and since there wasn't a school that would admit her within a mile radius, I don't think she ever finished her GED. I see her around sometimes, and I hear she's dating some junkie twice her age. Number 3 I was in 8th grade in 1995, and my father received a transfer overseas, moving us to Pakistan. All of my classmates at middle school kept making random jokes that I was going to get shot and killed. Just a few weeks earlier, four Americans were killed in Karachi, Pakistan. I moved to Pakistan and things went smoothly. Then one day, when I was in a junior high school, my older brother who graduated high school in 1993 was visiting and woke me up around 4am and told me to go up to the multi-system. We had two TVs, an NTSC that played US movies that was hooked up to our armed forces radio and television service that was the smaller multi-systems TV that we used to watch news and stuff. Anyway, blurry-eyed, I was not really understanding what I was seeing, and I asked him what I was looking at. That was our house, was his response. Then it hit me. We were looking at our old house on the corner of Pierce and West Pork Avenue in Littleton, Colorado with a police sniper on the roof, looking north towards Columbine High School on a British news station via satellite in Islamabad, Pakistan. Several of my classmates from Leewood Elementary and Ken Carl Middle School were shot, and at least one kid who had warned me that I would be killed in Pakistan was dead. Not sure if that counts as survival, but it hit close to home for me. My ultra-supportive dad later weighed in on the situation and said, Hey, most of the kids killed were in the library, and with you being a dumbass, you probably wouldn't have been there. I felt absolutely horrible. Number 4 I went to a Catholic school. And so we had a school chaplain, who was essentially a sort of friend to the kids. It sounds really creepy when you say it like that, but this dude was absolutely amazing. He talked multiple students out of suicide, helped tons of kids come to terms with and overcome bullying, harassment, and sexual slash domestic abuse, as well as encouraging every single student to reach for their dreams. Anyway, he once went the extra mile for a very troubled family at my school. The two kids in question were adopted brothers and were both incredibly unstable. 
the brothers would be your very best friend one second, and then suddenly fly off the handle the next, making you literally fear for your life. Anyway, knowing their family problems, the school chaplain volunteered to become the two boys' godfathers, in order to legally be able to help them and their family out financially. After about a year that I finished school, the school chaplain appeared in the local newspaper. He had been arrested and imprisoned for raping the elder of the two lads. For most people, that was enough to condemn him. But most of the people I went to school with found the whole thing somewhat suspicious. Whenever someone encountered one of the two boys, they would instantly launch into a step-by-step -step recount of what happened, as if desperate to convince everyone they knew that they were telling the truth. The only thing wrong was that these step-by-step -step recounts were usually vastly different each time they were told, as if poorly thought out. Regardless, the chaplain was imprisoned and eventually died of cancer while still inside. It was only after his death that it finally came to light that the rape never happened. The chaplain had run into financial trouble himself and so was unable to keep giving financial assistance to the boy's family. As punishment, the whole family, yes, the parents were the ones who came up with the idea, invented the rape story to teach him a lesson. The guy was a hero. He even helped my girlfriend at the time get through her parents' divorce in one piece. And yet his lot in life would end up with him sad, forgotten and alone. Number 5 I was in 8th grade at the time. In the classroom pretty close to ours, one kid had brought a gun with him, thinking that it was a replica. He was playing around with it, and quietly showing it off to his friends in the middle of the classroom. Apparently the professor was preparing an experiment for chemistry class, and was not supervising them. As the teacher went back into the room, the boy was pretty hysterical, and grabbed the gun from his friend. In the process, he accidentally pulled the trigger. The bullet hit the flask the teacher was holding and went into his arm. We just heard the bullet exploding the glass and the scream of agony that followed. Our teacher told us to be quiet and went outside the room to check what happened in the chemistry lab. We really were silent, dead silent, which is pretty surprising in a class full of 14 year olds. We were all in fear of what happened and what was about to happen. We had to stay in the classroom, but everyone was gathered around the windows when an ambulance and two police cars arrived. The teacher had two surgeries and suffered from chemical burns. The boy got suspended. I never heard from him again. Fortunately, no one lost their life. None of us ever forgot and kept the lesson from the incident. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. At the time of uploading, I'm almost at 30,000 subscribers, which is mind-blowing. I can't put into words how grateful I am for all of you. I'm so glad that you're enjoying my work, and there's plenty more to come. Please remember to smash that like button and subscribe, as you won't want to miss what I have in store for you next. I have some of your favourite topics coming to you on the 25th and 26th, big days, so be ready. If you have had a creepy or paranormal experience that you wish to share, feel free to send it to my email which you can find in the description. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter, at The Mortis Media for some secret stuff you won't find anywhere else. But anyway, for now guys I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.